Our next speaker is a close friend to the community who shows his continuous support to the cause. He's a senior lecturer with a PhD in international politics from Sydney University. Dr. Tim Anderson will be speaking about the contemporary issues such as the legal settlements and blockades, including the US Embassy move to Jerusalem and what are its future implications. Please welcome him to the stage with, with a round of applause. Thank you. Um, good evening, friends. <clears throat> Your Excellency, Ambassador Bahaji, and other friends, it's a beautiful thing to share uh, this iftar with such a, a warm crowd. And thank you also, Sheikh Nami and Hash Hussain, for the invitation. <clears throat> I want to start by just saying a few words about a, a rare opportunity. I had to visit Al Quds earlier this year. Um, it was uh, a short visit, but, uh, and I was, think, lulled into a sense of security by coming in from Jordan through Jericho and staying in Ramallah. And the semblance of normality in Ramallah and then passing through into Al Quds through that now uh, icon of the apartheid regime, the separation barrier, which is sometimes a fence and sometimes a wall. And I'd heard about it, but I hadn't experienced it. And I was really shocked, to tell you the truth. I was, as I said, relaxed from being in Ramallah, which is, seems like a normal Arab city. And then the entrance to the, or, or passing through the wall, which is regulated by, according to people's passports and IDs, and Palestinians have different colors and so on, and it's a very complex set of apartheid regulations. But the entrance to the segregated area is like a cattle shed. I've been into many prisons and the prison entrance is better than the entrance to uh, Jerusalem there. It's like a cattle shed which they hose down at times. Uh, then you pass through uh, a, <clears throat> a passageway with various doors where arrogant children, Israeli children with guns, make demands of you through walls and then anyway you get through you take another taxi the wall is a long way from the city from the old city of Al Quds and in the city then the Damascus gate facing north the Damascus gate but it's very strange for me it was very strange because the combination of factors going on there there is uh, on the one hand massive tourism mainly Christians most of the old city is a Muslim quarter. A small part of it is a Jewish quarter with massive investment. Um, there are armed people, armed Israeli young people all through it. I tried to go into Al-Aqsa. They wouldn't let me in. At that day, only old Arab men were allowed in. I was old enough, but I wasn't Arab enough. I couldn't even take photos. Uh, of uh, Al-Aqsa Al because they started chasing me back down the, the, the passageways. It reminded me of that biblical expression how they turned the house of God into a den of thieves. You know, there is money lenders, there are people stealing land. It's a strange combination of things and it's a very jarring, for me it was a very jarring experience. So, uh, Jerusalem, uh, the other thing to be said, uh, I want to just mention about that time was that something you notice when you're there is that there is conflict every day. We hear about the big actions, the big action in Gaza now, but when I arrived in Jericho, they killed a man around the corner who had done some individual act. When I got to Ramallah, they were sniping on the colonies because around every city, around Nablus and Ramallah and Hebron, there are four or five colonies around, the, around each city. Each colony has an army base, each colony has feeder roads, fences, uh, other land and so on. So they are trying to swallow the entire entity of Palestine, but at the same time they have made themselves vulnerable because every, every feeder road is sniped on and rocks are thrown at. And at night the people from the camps come out, the camps that are in the cities that have more or less been absorbed in the cities, and they come out and the, the colonists in the camp come out and that conflict happens. And in the evening the troops go in. During the day the cities are normal and in the evening the troops can come in at any time. Otherwise Israelis are banned from those cities. So it's a very unusual atmosphere. There's this low-level war going on constantly, every day. 
we don't hear about what's happening every day. Well, to me, that seems to be uh, the resistance and the arrogant power of that situation seems to be the eye of a storm that exists in this entire region now. We thought progress had been made at different times now. Just this year, the economic sanctions have returned to, uh, against Iran. Okay, it's divided the Europeans, it's divided the Americans. But the North Americans have showed their word is worth nothing. They've, thrown up, they've torn up that agreement, which you can say was a bad agreement to start with, but they've torn it up. They've reimposed sanctions on Iran. They're reimposing sanctions on Iraq. Why? Because the people that saved Iraq from Daesh several years ago, Hashid al-Shabi, the popular mobilization units, won in the elections also. So now they reimpose sanctions on Iraq. So we have economic war against Iran, against Iraq, against Syria, against Lebanon, because really if they impose sanctions on Hezbollah, it's against the whole of Lebanon. And of course the sanctions against Palestine and the blockade on Yemen. We have the entire region under an economic war and a propaganda war because as the great Chilean leader Salvador Allende said back in the early 60s about what the Western media said about Cuba, they lie every minute of every day about what's going on. There's a propaganda war, there's an economic war, and there's a real war going on. But, and this is where the logic of anti-imperialists in the West sometimes miss, there is a logic of resistance also. There's a logic of arrogant power, there's the Mustadafin, the oppressed people, but there is also the resistance carried out by those oppressed people. And now I think we can say uh, with confidence that Iran is stronger than ever despite the controversy that's going on now. Iraq is rising from the ashes. There is the core of a, of a, of a new state in Iraq precisely through the Hashid al-Shabi. Syria heroically and against the odds is defeating a huge international array of forces and proxy armies with its close friends and particularly its regional friends. Yemen is defeating the monster in Riyadh. Poor Yemen, the poorest country in the region, but the arrogant power in Riyadh can't finish off Yemen. The resistance in Lebanon has made put the Zionists on the back foot. They don't want to move forward. They're very careful. For more than a decade they've worried about making the wrong move there. And the resistance in Palestine is also shaming the Zionists and the empire, the US also. So there's advances being made there. To me the Palestinian resistance hasn't gone away. Uh, they're not helpless victims too. It's one thing that was said to me by a number of people in Palestine. We don't want to be seen as helpless victims. We are a people with a culture and a history here. They have aid organizations going to Palestine saying, oh, here's some European women to tell your mothers how to be good mothers. They said, they're laughing. They say, is this a joke? Here's a woman who has four children, six children, and some European says, here's how to be a confident mother. What's going on here? This young man in Dahesha camp in Bethlehem, was telling me about this. And the Haitian camp is one of those camps from 1949, 1950. And uh, one thing they've rejected there is sectarianism against religions, between religions, because the Israelis play that game. They try to divide the Christians, they try to divide the Druze, and people reject that. They wouldn't have the Muslim Brotherhood in the Haitian camp, they kicked them out. But the Israelis in the last two years have gone in and have a campaign of shooting every young man in the leg and in the knees. They've shot over 200 in that one camp in the legs to try and cripple them, to stop them being engaged in the resistance. And I could hardly believe it and I looked up and I said, this has been reported. It was reported 18 months ago but then it was forgotten about it still going on in Hebron, in Bethlehem for example. So this young man, Isa in Dahesha said to me at the end, and I want to finish on this point, he said, we are not helpless victims. This is a resistance statement. We are not helpless victims to be patronised and pitied. We are people with a culture and a history. Thank you, my friends.